Hey, so one of the more deceptively challenging aspects of creating video game audio for the beginning sound designer is the use and creation of audio loops. So first it's helpful to understand why we use loops in audio for video games. Uh, video games display a persistent virtual environment and in that environment, things need to exist on a timeline that can, can expand and contract with the player's motion. And in order to do this, we need to have files that loop. So backgrounds, even though we have a level that might be 15 minutes long, we can't put 15 minute long files in there to kind of cover the background. Most likely it's gonna be a 25 to 30 second file that loops. And then there'll be other sounds that kind of play intermittently that kind of disguise the fact that there's just this uh, looping environment. But for the most part, we use loops for that. Also for um, objects inside the game. For example, you're walking by a torch and you hear it flaming. Most likely that flame is gonna be a loop. Right, just a little loop of a flame going, probably maybe four or five seconds, that just kind of loops constantly. So one of the challenges with loops is that we don't want people to know that there's loops going on in the game, because when they hear loops as a player, it can pull you out of the game, and that's, we don't want to do that. So there's a couple of things that give away loops right away. One is, and I'll show you, I just got a, um, a dungeon ambience here I created for a game. Let's just listen to a bit of it. So if that's my background ambience for this dungeon level, for example, and I need it to loop, one of the easiest ways to test what it's gonna sound like as a looping file is you can just loop it in Pro Tools. I don't wanna play the whole 15 second file through and just keep kind of listen to it. So I'm just gonna audition the loop boundary by just duplicating the file, right? And it's gonna to listen to this section here. Just That's the part I'm concerned about right now. Uh, I just wanna hear if it loops or not. So let's take a listen. Did you hear that? Let's listen again. Right? So what did we hear? We heard a click. If you listen again, there's one more sound in there too. There's the click and the audio is actually different. So even if the click weren't there, we'd still hear the little bit of shift in, this, in the style of the audio. So let's fix that. Um, let's just see why it's clicking first. Let's go look, zoom in on this and we can see, uh, there's our waveform crossing from positive to negative. And you can see the edit here interrupts a waveform, uh, both on the left and right channels. And also on the end of the file, the interform, the waveform is interrupted, it's broken. What we need to do is we need to find what's called the zero crossing. In other words, the point at which the waveform goes from positive to negative value. And we need to do it for both channels. Now, a lot of digital audio workstations, not Pro Tools, but a lot of digital audio workstations contain a function called snap to zero crossing. Reaper has it, I think Logic has it, I even think uh, Nuendo has it. Pro Tools, we gotta do it the old fashioned way. We need to actually locate the zero crossing by, by eye and, um, and then we'll check it by ear after that. So sometimes this can be tedious on stereo material because you'll, get, you'll find a zero crossing that's perfect on the right side, but it's not quite on the left side. Here's an example right there. If you kind of look at that, zero crossing on the left, not quite on the right. We need to find as close as to both channels as possible to make this uh, seamless and get rid of that click. And uh, like I said, this can be time consuming. Let's get some, some more space here. That one's pretty close. Let's take a look at this. So that's an example of close, and I'm gonna dare say close enough. So if you zoom in really on this waveform, you can see uh, it's not quite 100%, but that that's close enough to zero crossing for me and for our demo. In fact, that's close enough uh, I would use that. In fact, I'm going to use that. So that's our zero crossing uh, on the front. Now, my technique for looping doesn't require us to find the zero crossing also at the end of the file. Okay, that would be the, the obvious or the logical next choice. Like, oh, we find the zero crossing at the end of the file, and we could do that. Uh, find the zero crossing at the end, but that only takes care of the clicking part. It doesn't take care of the problem that the audio at the end of the file sounds slightly different. It has evolved differently with different tonal textures than the beginning of the file. So my technique is gonna take care of that. So let's just take this edited version out. And when working in games, I always make copies of everything and then work on the copy and then leave a breadcrumb trail about my work because almost everything you do with video games is gonna to have to be revised. Um, you always have to turn it in or you always have to put it in the, in the system, put it in the game, try and test it out and you realize stuff you thought worked didn't. So I always like to leave myself a breadcrumb trail to kind of remember how I created things because I might not come back to this ambience for two or three more weeks, for example, and I kind of want to remember what my work process was. So I always make a copy and deal with the copy. So to make this a looping file, I'm going to duplicate it, right? 
And then I'm gonna make a copy down to an adjacent track. Just make a copy and then I'm gonna mute that copy. Now all this is doing down here is just serving as kind of like a guide or a ruler. And it's just gonna remind me after I complete this process about where my zero crossing was on the beginning of the file. We're gonna ignore the end of the file. So if we remember, we got rid of our click by locating the zero crossing in the beginning of this file. But the other problem was that the audio here at the end sounds different than the audio here at the beginning. So what I need to do is kind of create this, what would naturally flow into this audio. And you can do this either on the front of the audio or the back. I've chosen to do it on the front is take my trimmer tool and just reclaim some of this audio here by dragging it back out. And as a general rule with ambiences in most audio, I always kind of create eight to 10 times more sound than what I actually need. So if I need a 10 second ambience, I'm gonna create at least a minute of audio uh, because you often have to do multiple versions and I wanna have some leeway in what I can uh, choose and, and work together with. Now I have this kind of like crude little mark here. I'm just gonna pop a crossfade in here and you can do runs of varying lengths and you obviously are gonna to have to massage this to according to how it sounds like and we're gonna to listen to it in a second. But now I'm just gonna take, uh, pop down to this adjacent track, pop my cursor over and then pop up and then I'm gonna trim that off. That was where my zero crossing was. That was the purpose of holding onto this audio file just to remind myself where the zero crossing was. Now, theoretically, the audio here will flow seamlessly into the audio here. So again, I'm gonna make a copy, right? And then I'm gonna test it. There's a couple different ways you can test it. On longer files, what I typically tend to do is just put it in dynamic transport mode, right? And drag my playhead over, because what I wanna do is audition this crossfade and the loop boundary. So then I'll just press, press play. Lawless, right? The other way of testing it, if you don't have dynamic transport or you don't wanna be bothered with that, is just make a dupe and then just kind of audition across the crossfade and the loop boundary. Excellent. Okay, so that works. Now I'm going to make a copy. Obviously, now what I have to put this into the video game, I need a whole file to do that. I can't have two files with an edit on it. And if this was actually going to be delivered to the game, I might spend some more time on this crossfade, just making sure there's nothing funky in there that's going to pop out or make a noise. Um, but for now, for the purpose of the demo, I'm going to say that this is good. And let's see, I'm going to just take this for a second and just call this uh, loop. So now when I consolidate this file, there's my loop, and then I can export it out to my desktop um, for delivery. Now, one final step I always do, I don't quite trust Pro Tools 100% that this file that I just exported is gonna loop flawlessly in the game. So I always kind of just pop over to a game piece of software. In this case, it's gonna be um, uh, FMOD. And FMOD you can use, um, download for free. And I just create a simple event, and I'm just gonna call it loop. Right, and then it's gonna grab my loop file that I grabbed or just created, and it's gonna pop it in here, and I'm gonna make it a repeating loop, and I'm just gonna audition it. Uh, and all I'm really listening for, but since this is a tool that's actually designed to deliver audio in a video game, if it loops in here, it should loop flawlessly in the game. I know it looped because there's a piece of audio in there that jumps out. There was a guy way in the background going, whoo, right? I don't know if you heard that or not. So what I would do at this point, because I caught that, I would go back to my original audio file, edit that part out because that's one of those indicators that, oh my God, that's looping. We don't want that. So I would edit that part out, remake the edit, re-export, try this process again. When it worked, deliver to the client, get paid, have a nice day. Okay, so that's how you create a looping file, my technique for creating looping files for video games. I hope this helped you in your effort to create looping files for your games, and I hope you'll check us out more for more tips here at PureMind Online. I was heavily involved with music, loved video games, loved film forever. I had truly no idea how this stuff worked until I came here. Games are the next level beyond filmmaking. So if you can grasp the concepts of sound design, working with linear images, and composing to linear picture, you can then begin to evolve into the next level of integrating sound and music into a non-linear environment. 
every student basically picks a section of gameplay that they're going to completely redesign the sound for. In addition to designing the sound as a movie, we're also going to treat that as a virtual persistent environment that they need to create a full suite of sounds for that could be put into a game engine and actually turn that into a real live video game. Paramine was actually super essential because it gave me a systematic view of audio production. Pyramine also really, really helped me with project management, music theory, middleware, music business has come up. Just about everything I took helped me at Double Fine. You're learning at Pyramine from the real guys that are doing the work in the industry. That's priceless. You're walking out with a portfolio piece that says, I have these skills, I understand how this business works, and I understand what employers and companies are looking for in this creative space.